Okay, moving on now to give an overview of the contributions from metamorphic petrology to tectonics. Hopefully you've all seen a metamorphic facies diagram like this before, and you recall that we use particular names uh, for different domains in pressure temperature space. These are referred to as the metamorphic facies. And there are also historically even more names, just to amp up the terminology, but these are, there are names for common pressure temperature trajectories that are encountered in various tectonic settings. For example, pressure temperature paths that show relatively high P to T ratios are referred to as the high pressure series, and they pretty much always signify a cold environment characteristic of subduction. Metamorphic complexes that show more intermediate temperature to pressure ratios are referred to as Barovian series. These are typical of orogenic belts uh, where subduction has transitioned to continental collision and orogenic wedge development uh, that generates a significant amount of radiogenic heat during tectonism, the Alps being a good example. And then magmatic arcs are typically forming fairly close to the surface, but are of course quite hot. So they typically define the low pressure, um, but high temperature Buchan series and uh, contact metamorphism, uh, which is Hornfels. Something used very frequently um, to reconstruct tectonic histories are pressure temperature paths that track how the rocks have proceeded through these different metamorphic facies and series. And uh, these are often very diagnostic of particular tectonic environments. Focusing first on the diagram on the left, for relatively simple pressure temperature paths, we refer to the burial and heating uh, phases of metamorphism as prograde, and the decompression and cooling phases of metamorphism as retrograde. Many PT paths are clockwise, but they don't necessarily have to be, and some are counterclockwise as the blue curve um, in the center diagram. And it's also good to keep in mind that some pressure temperature paths reach their peak pressure and peak temperatures at the same point. Focusing now on the right-hand diagram, the purple curve and yellow square shows an example of a coincident peak pressure and peak temperature point. This curve also shows a very similar prograde and retrograde pressure temperature path. This is a common PT path seen in subduction zones where subductive material is exhumed close to the slab itself, so it remains refrigerated. But this curve contrasts with the one shown in orange, which is an example of a PT path for which the peak pressure and peak, peak temperature uh, points do not coincide. And likewise, it shows very different pressure temperature trajectories on the prograde path uh, compared to the retrograde path. This is more typical of a case where subductive material is not exhumed from close to the downgoing slab, but instead is exhumed through extension in much uh, warmer, uh, or through the much warmer upper plate. We'll talk more about some specific examples of the tectonic scenarios that fit uh, these common PT paths in later lectures. I'll just note here too that sometimes these different kinds of pressure temperature paths characteristically occur together in what's termed a paired metamorphic belt. One of the classic examples is to have two rock bodies side by side, one that exhibits a clockwise pressure temperature path showing uh, the subduction and exhumation process, and another showing an anticlockwise pressure temperature path uh, showing uh, or reflecting gradual burial and heating. And this particular paired metamorphic belt is a hallmark of subduction and is in fact what's been used um, since the early 1970s to identify remnants of subduction even in very fragmented or dismembered um, ancient tectonic provinces. I won't discuss this in, in much detail, but just as a, as a reminder of how different segments of PT paths are even measured, it's through using both qualitative and quantitative tools in petrography and petrology, including petrographic observations of microscale features such as mineral inclusions and metamorphic reactions, as well as using measured major and trace element chemistry of different mineral phases, um, coupled with experimental constraints on their phase stabilities, 
which allows to estimate the pressure temperature conditions over which those particular mineral chemistries should uh, be stable. This is just a nice example um, optical image of a thin section of the mineral jadeite, which is a sodium rich, high pressure, low temperature phase uh, formed in quite cold subduction environments. And here you can see it's, it's breaking down to the phases albite uh, plus quartz. And we know from experiment where this reaction uh, should lie in pressure temperature space. It's shown in orange on the right hand diagram. And so we use this breakdown reaction to draw at least one section of the pressure temperature path such that we know the rocks had to cross through uh, this reaction. Many more examples of these kinds of diagnostic breakdown reactions um, for both prograde and retrograde metamorphic rocks, of course. Coming back though to the larger scale of using uh, PT paths to understand tectonics, by assembling many of these pressure temperature paths from throughout the world for specific tectonic study, settings, we start to see some diagnostic patterns showing up. This is a global compilation of pressure temperature paths from metamorphic core complexes, which are regions of large scale continental extension. We'll talk about uh, these in detail in a couple of weeks. But although these core complexes span a wide range of peak temperatures that they reach, what nearly all of them has in common is this phase of isothermal decompression or even slight warming associated with their exhumation path. And this is telling us something fundamental about the tectonic process that allowed these rocks uh, to return to the surface. And we'll talk more about that process um, later when we discuss extensional uh, domains. Here's another example of different pressure temperature paths. In this case, comparing Archean pressure temperature trajectories for rocks preserved in Archean cratons to modern, essentially Mesozoic and Cenozoic pressure temperature paths for some classic metamorphic complexes such as the Franciscan and the Western Alps. And I'm sure right away you can pick out the difference. The Archean pressure temperature paths all reach very high uh, peak temperatures independent of whether they're clockwise or counterclockwise. And this is of course one key piece of information that teaches us about Earth's secular cooling over geologic time, reflecting the fact that the early Earth's mantle was much hotter than it is presently. And we can use these estimates from Archean domains to help quantify exactly how hot and potentially how the mode or modes of planetary cooling changed uh, over billion year timescales. So metamorphic petrology pro provides another piece of the puzzle that combined with structural geology gives us information about the deformation and the conditions at which the deformation occurred. But it of course leaves open many questions about the fourth dimension of time. For example, here's a generic pressure temperature path that's showing three deformation events under three different metamorphic regimes. D1 occurred under prograde conditions and reflects burial. D2 shows this kind of isothermal decompression, slight heating, uh, and shows exhumation. And D3 occurred under cooling conditions during final exhumation to the surface. But without knowledge of the timescales of these PT events, the tectonic process we might infer is very non-unique. So for example, if D1 occurred very quickly, we might infer it represents thrust faulting and erogeny, whereas if it were slow, perhaps it was a gradual burial during magmatism or sedimentation. And if D2 was fast, it might reflect very fast exhumation and advection of heat to allow the temperatures to remain high. Whereas if it was slow, we'd have to figure out well, what allowed the temperatures to remain so constant. Was there some nearby heat source? Similarly for D3, if it occurred over a short duration, we might infer that some larger faulting event allowed the rocks to essentially uh, be quenched as they were raised to the surface. Whereas if the event was very slow, perhaps it was just a very gradual exhumation process that was facilitated uh, by slow erosion of the overburdened. So an additional puzzle piece we need in unraveling tectonic histories is of course, geochronology. Here's a food for thought question, if you're so inclined. Um, I showed this plot a couple slides ago of Archean versus modern pressure temperature paths. If you look at this more closely in conjunction with some of the other diagrams uh, in this lecture, 
can you figure out which metamorphic facies might not have even existed in the Archean due to these hotter temperatures? And can you think about what this might mean for our ability to recognize tectonic regimes, for example, the onset of subduction um, in the deep past? 